How about that so hard? You might have to put a loop on that one, man. Good evening, good evening, good evening. This is Joaquin Thompson with the Daily Bread Radio Show coming to you live and ready to get into it tonight. We had an awesome show last weekend, got a lot of positive feedback, talking about that financial brutality. So we got a new term that we didn't coin, so financial brutality is on our radar, and we're also talking about the five phases of dealing with collections. So this week we're going to you know, turn it up. Start off where we left off last week because the energy was so high. It was so good. It was just like, it was just right. So I think we need to start there. And because with teaching, what you have to do is always review, be repetitive, and then start to act on it. Because it's not enough to just hear it in the ear and write it down. You've got to go back and practice. You've got to practice. So what we're going to do is I'm going to play um, part of my intro song. And then as soon as this song finishes, we're going to come right back and we're going to get right into it. the hammer. When I was talking about this last week, yeah. I went dug it up. The essential I'm writing that, speech is one. Read that, man. It's powerful. I'm going to read that, man. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Woo! Yeah, you, you, hey, look at it. You going to leave that with me, man. I'm going to read that, man. You finish with it? I'm going to read that, man. I'm going to read that, man. <laughs> look at it. I'm going to read that, man. Go take a picture, man. Nah, I ain't take no picture, man. Uh. I'm going to read a picture, man. I just think I got a thousand pages. I'm going to take a picture, man. Take a picture, man. man I ain't heard That's that what talk. we gonna do. I ain't even heard that talk. Don't take a picture, man. No, That's what we gonna do, no, bro. All right, then.
Budweiser. I'm better. Oh, we didn't cut the music off. That's what's going on. Good evening, good evening, good evening. This is Joaquin with Daily Bread Radio Show and coming to you live again this Thursday. We're going to be going from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. The call in number 678-381-1973. 678-381-1973. I'm available to answer any questions that you may have, any comments that you have, any clarification that you need on anything on this content because this is some powerful information. I, I mean, I usually go back and listen to my shows and just try to critique them, try to make them better. Just pro what, what, what we call process improvement, because that's something that everybody should do. If you're working on your craft, whatever you're doing, if you're, you know, beautician, if you're a contractor, if you're an artist, if you play music, you should always be working on your craft and just go back and critique it a little bit. I know we are our hardest critic, but last week, I just have to be totally honest. I went back and listened to the show last week, and the thing about last week's show was. I really feel that last week's show, I turned the corner. I mean, I really turned the corner because, you know, one of the things about doing information or providing information, sometimes we can be a little, a little hesitant to, to be totally transparent, to really get down to the root cause and just really call ourselves out and talk about some, some serious matters. And I think right now what, what happened was, is, uh, the way that I explain it is God interceded and gave me some information to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to share some stuff with you that's in you that you didn't know was in you, and I'm going to pull it out. I didn't practice it. It just came, and as we started getting into the dialogue and the stuff that we was talking about, it just started to connect. Now, the most powerful thing was this. The things that have happened since that time, because it was other things that happened. I spoke it. I spoke on it last Thursday, but from last Thursday to this Thursday, we've had some powerful things to happen and transpire from a personal finance perspective. So some of those things we've looked at and some of those things we've talked about. So this week, what I want to do is pick up from where we left off last week and keep moving forward. Because the thing about learning is you always want to review first. Ask questions. Ask a bunch of questions. So on our show, I really encourage people to call in. You know, you can leave messages. If you don't want to call in, you bashful. If you want to just leave messages on the Facebook uh, live, then I'll try to read the Facebook live and answer those questions while we're on the air. But the thing about personal finance is this. You have to learn the keys of personal finance. You have to learn the keys because you're dealing with it every day. If you're pumping gas, you're dealing with personal finance. If you're swiping a card, you're dealing with personal finance. If you're paying a bill, you're dealing with personal finance. And what you have to do is you want to make sure that you understand this game because it's very complex. It can be complex, but if you practice, it can be very, very simple and very, very rewarding in what you do. So I'm going to pick up where we left off last week. I wanted to give some clarifying information because last week we talked about the five components of credit. And I know the feedback from a lot of uh, people that listened to the show was that we want to talk more about credit. We need to spend some more time with credit. So what I did was at that time, I said I was going to take out the next three to four weeks to just talk about credit. Just talk about credit because credit is the main thing. It's that pillar that sits in the middle of everything that kind of drives everything that you do in your life from a personal finance standpoint. So, again, we're going to review the five components of what goes into a credit score. So number one, payment history. We talked about payment history and how important it is to pay your bills on time. That's 35% of your credit score. The second thing or the second component of your credit score is your payment history. That's 30, well, I'm sorry. Second thing is amount of debt. I'll stand corrected. Amount of debt is the second thing. Um, and with the amount of debt, that's 30% of your score. So when you look at your payment history and the amount of debt, that's 65% of your credit score right there. So even if we stop right there, if you just focus on those two components, you'll be in much better shape when you start to understand how they work and how they work together. The third component is the utilization of credit. That's 15% of your score. So when you look at payment history, when you look at the amount of debt, when you look at credit utilization or the, the amount of credit that you're utilizing, that's 80% of your credit score. So again, if we stop right there, if you just manage those three 
components, three of the five components, you would be in a much better place if you knew how to manipulate, if you knew how to manage those three components. Now, when you move to the fourth component, the fourth component is what we call new credit. And new credit is self-explanatory. That's when you go out and you get a new loan or you get a new credit card. That's new credit. That's 10%. And the last component of your credit score is what we call credit mix. And credit mix is 10% of your score. And when we say credit mix, credit mix is when you have different types of credit. Like you may have a mortgage and then you have installment loans and then you have revolving credit. That's 10%. So it looks at your overall credit profile and that's 10% of your score. So last week we got into the five phases of collections. But before I got into collections, I was telling you about 30 day past dues and 60 day past dues. So I want to come to you this week and give you some clarifying information or, or what we want to say is we want to go a little deeper. So to go a little deeper, I'm going to give you some additional information about what we call account history status codes. Because remember last week I was kind of struggling with, what do you call these? Is it the indicator? Is it the, I know what it is, but I was like, what was the right name? So it's really called a status code history, account history status code. So, and I'm gonna give them, I'm gonna give them all to you. Now, one of the things that I'm gonna challenge you to do tonight, and we've talked about this going all the way back to my first show in February. And I know this may be counterintuitive or it may not be popular, but I have to say this. Don't listen to the show every week. Don't take notes on the show every week if you're not going to take some action. You have to take action in order for this to work for you. You have to take action because these things that I'm giving you, they require you to take action. It's like going to a gym and just sitting on a bench and watching people work out. You're not going to get in shape watching people work out. You got to grab them dumbbells or you got to get in that Pilates class or you got to stretch, especially them hamstrings. You got to stretch them hamstrings out. You know, get to them love handles, but you got to do some work. It's, you got to put some effort into it. So what I'm going to challenge you all to do tonight, everybody that's listening to the broadcast on the radio, everybody that's listening to me on Facebook Live, what I'm going to challenge you to do tonight, tonight or sometime, may not be tonight, this, I'm going to give you a little, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a good teacher, a good professor, and I'm going to give you the weekend to get it done. How about that? So... By Monday, because the holiday is Tuesday, and we know Tuesday, a lot of people are going to be chilling, barbecuing, and all that, but between now and Sunday, just let's just make a commitment. So on Facebook Live, I know you got the little like buttons and the little hearts and things. So if you feel like you can do this by Sunday, I'm going to tell you what I need you to do. Just hit the little button on there and say, okay. So that'll give me an indication that you're hearing what I'm saying and you're, you're receptive to it and you feel like this is something that you can do. This is, and it's, it's a simple thing to do. I need you to pull your credit report. I need you, you to pull your credit report. Not wait till you get ready to buy something or you want somebody else to pull it for you. I need you to go out to Credit Karma, Equifax.com, TransUnion.com, Experian.com, AnnualCreditReport.com. Go to one of those free sites and pull your credit report. Now, why is that important? It's important for a number of reasons. And here's the primary reason. The stuff that I talked about last week and the things that I'm going to talk about tonight, well, wait a minute, let me pause. Hit the little button if, if you can handle that. Okay, I see you. I see you actually got the thumbs up. So you can either use the thumbs up or you can put the heart in there. If you, you would love to pull your own credit report. So I, I saw Ashley respond and... Uh, so if anybody else feel like they can do that between today and Sunday, so you got plenty of time. And it's free. And it's free. So by law, here's a little tip for you. By law, you get two, you get access to two free credit reports by law directly from the credit bureau. Even if you don't want to go through Credit Karma or some of these other sites that will offer you a free credit report, you can go to Equifax.com and by law, by law, federal law, they have to give you two free credit reports every year. So think about that. So take some time, pull your credit report. Now, when we start talking about account history status codes, when you get your credit report, the first thing that you want to do is you want to learn how to, excuse me, because this is a skill that you have to develop. It's like any other skill, like cooking 
or baking or, you know, whatever you do, riding a bike. This is a skill that you have to develop over time. When you get your credit report or you, you download your credit report, what I'm going to ask you to do, take a second step, print it out, get a hard copy. Because what you want to do is you're going to want to sit down with a nice cup of coffee or some iced tea in a nice quiet place, put on some music, and sit down uninterrupted. So you may have to wait till the kids go to sleep. You may have to, you may have to wait for whatever. But get a nice quiet place, nice and quiet, where you can sit down and you can focus and you can read your credit report. Now, reading your credit report is, is kind of like when you was in pre-K and learning how to read a book. Because you remember when you first started learning to read a book, it was certain blends and you had consonants and vowels and this was sentence structure and, you know, the cat in the hat and all of that. But when you start, to, when you pull your credit report yourself for the first time and you start to read it, it's going to be cumbersome. It's just going to look like a bunch of you know, like what some people call gobbledygook. It's just going to be a bunch of stuff, and you you reading it, and you're like, well, what is, is this? Is it good, or is it bad? Because if you pull your credit report without your score, and you don't know how to read a credit report effectively, you won't know if you're winning or losing, and that's the truth. So I would challenge you to pull your credit report without the score the first time, and I'll challenge you to read through everything on your credit report. Read all of the... Because there's good and bad things on everybody's credit report. Some people got more good than bad. Some people got more bad than good. But like we talked about last week, it don't matter. It don't matter. The game is continuing to go on as long as you live it. The game will continue. So you don't have to worry about that. So pull your credit report. And when you pull your credit report, you want to say, okay, nice, quiet place, uninterrupted. Start to learn how to read it. Read account by account. Okay, I got Macy's. I got... JC Penney's, okay, I got my car loan, okay, I got my mortgage. And then the next step you want to do is start looking at your account history. So you may have had this credit card for two years. If you've had it for two years, you may have some trouble. And that's what we talked about last week, which were the account history status codes. So I'm going to run through those this week and give you some additional information so that way we can get into some of the things that we talked about last week, which I told you were deep that had to do with Martin Luther King. And this is deep because a lot of times the media, they tell us what they want us to know. So I'm gonna just put that on hold for a minute, but just remember what I just said. Martin Luther King, the media, tell us what they want us to know. But let's talk about status codes real quick. So you pulled your credit report, you got a nice quiet place, you're sitting down, you're starting to read through your report. So what you wanna be looking for, so there are about 10 or 12 different codes that's gonna be on your credit report. Now, the first one we talked about last week, 30 days past due to 59 days past due. The second one, 60 days past due to 89 days past due. The third one, 90 days past due to 119 days past due. So now you're getting into the red. 120 days past due to 149 days past due. 150, the next one is 150 days past due to 179. So now you're getting up to like six months. So now it's, it's getting real dicey because now, you, now you're now you creeping up on that collection. Uh, and then you have 180 days past due and above. 180 is the cutoff because that's what? That's six months, right? So now when you get into that space, and I see my nephew on, so I'm going to have him call into the show um, if he ain't bashful. I mean, he's a really good guy. Because his background is collections. And it would be it would be an honor for the guests to hear from someone that works in that space. Why would it be important? It's important because if he has the knowledge about collections, think about what he can share with us from an inside standpoint. Not know what you read, because you know I read a bunch of books, not know what you heard, but if you can hear directly from somebody who works in collections, mm -hmm. it would just validate everything that you're learning. So I'm going to put a challenge out to my nephew. The call-in number, 678-381-1973. 678-381-1973.
nephew, if you got time, call into the show and let's talk a little bit about collections. But those are the first six codes. And then after you get to those codes, that's when you really start getting into what I call the, 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 the red zone. And the red zone is after you get past 180 days, now you got a collection account. Now after you get a collection account, you got a foreclosure. Now after foreclosures, you got voluntary surrender. We didn't talk about voluntary surrender, but voluntary surrender, what that is, is you can have a car, and before it goes into a repo, you can reach back out to the lender and say, you know what, I am in over my head. I can't take it no more. This car is killing me. I love it. I look good driving in it, but this note is killing me. Not only is it killing me, it's killing my family. Because me and my husband, we're fighting and, you know, arguing and carrying on. And it's killing me. So you could call the bank or the lender and say, you know what, and you can work out a deal where you voluntarily give the car back. Now, some people might say, wow, that, now that would be embarrassing. Oh, that would be, but guess what? It may save your life. It may save your life because one thing about debt, and I was doing some research yesterday about the number of suicides and depression that are linked to debt. So giving that car back, it, it, hey, it may be the best thing that ever happened to you because you get that, well, if you ever got a, a bill off of you like that, that's like getting a pit off of you. That's like getting a goddamn 800 pound gorilla off of you. So don't be, don't let your feelings and your pride get in the way of your health and your family. Because remember, the number one rule is what? Always do what's best for you and your family. Always, always do what's best for you and your family. Then that way you ain't gonna get in no trouble because you ain't worried about being embarrassed because you could come back from that. You could come back from, you can give them that car, you might be giving them that Honda Accord. So you can have this car back because I'm just, maybe I bit off more than I could chew. I thought I, I, I thought I was ready for the 2017 Honda Accord, fully equipped. Everything in it, heated seats, heated floor mats, ice trays, and champagnes. And, but then you find out, you know what? I ain't looked at my budget. And I ain't even realized I was, I didn't even realize I couldn't afford a $450 car note and the insurance was going to be 200 I didn't, because I didn't do my budget. And I didn't know it just looked good. So sometimes you might have to give it back. But guess what that's going to do? It's going to decrease the amount of stress that you have in your life. It may save your life. It may save your marriage. It may save your family. So don't let these material things get in the way. Sometimes you got to let them go. And sometimes what God will do is this. Because you know, sometimes we hard-headed, right? Like kids, hard-headed. Stop jumping. Stop jumping. As soon as you jump off the mattress and you fall and bump your head or knock a tooth out or something, then you start listening. So it's God will do the same thing. And guess what that comes in the form of? A repossession. Because you could have... <laughs> <laughs> you could have. <laughs> That's why we say our father, right? <laughs> he trying to tell us, like, look, man, <laughs> get a car back. <laughs> you don't want to. <laughs> you don't want to get a car back because you you don't want to be embarrassed when the, when them cats say, man, what a car. He's like, man. <laughs> but <laughs> don't worry about it. That's why he, that's why the press starts off with. It says, our Father. All seriousness. It says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The reason that prayer is in place is because you know you, you may need to give the car back. And, and it might, I said, hard to it might be a BMW. It might be a Mercedes. It might be a, you might have just got the range that you always wanted. But it's killing you. And this is the kind of stuff that's killing us as a people. Think about it. It's killing us. It's killing us. You paying car notes don't have no savings. Killing us. You got a kid that's ready to go to college. They got a scholarship. You say, oh, you got a full scholarship. But guess what? You don't have no money to send them for the stuff that the, the scholarship don't cover. So guess what? Now they got to come back home because you got the big Range Rover. Give it back. Give it back. And if you don't give it back, what our father will do is say, you know what? Let me Let me help you. Let me help you. And what I'm going to do for you is this. I'm going to send a guy by your house with a truck, and it might be Bernice. <laughs> it might be Bernice, but they're going to come by your house while you sound asleep, most times late at night or early in the morning, while you sound asleep, 
and they're going to pick that car up, and they're going to take it out of your driveway, unless you hide in the car, because you know we'll hide a car too now. We will hide a car, so if they find it, they will take it, but it'll be a blessing for you. That'll be a blessing. Forget the embarrassment. It'll be a blessing. You could come back from that, but what you can't come back from is if you let a depression take you deeper into a darker place, where you feel like you have no reason or nothing to live for, and then you turn around and do something that you're going to regret the rest of your life because of some stupid car. Let them people have that car. Same thing with that house. It's the same thing with that house. Now, you get into a situation with that, it's a million houses in the world, but you only got one family. You only got one family. So always do what's best for you and your family. So if you get into a situation with your house, say, you know what, man, bit off more than I can chew. I thought I needed the indoor pool and the sauna and the hot tub and, you know, the elevator and all this other stuff. Maybe you weren't ready for that. That's just, that's reality. That's like anything else. Like, when we used to play basketball. Sometimes we win basketball games, sometimes you lose. And what did you say? When you lost, I got next. I got next. It's the same thing in this credit game. I got next. You got me on that one. Got a repo. Got a foreclosure. No problem. I got next. Don't worry about what they say about them 10 years. You can come back from it if you learn what to do. So, wanted to get into those codes. Uh, wanted to talk to you all about that. Call in number again, 678-381-1973. The Facebook Live is just blowing up. I'm seeing people on there from all over, from Atlanta to Duval to D.C. I see some of everybody on there. So, hey, if you got a call or comment or if you want to wish me well or say happy birthday or whatever you want to say, Call in, let us know that you're out there, 678-381-1973. This is my 13th show. I got 1,000 shows to do. This is number 13. So as you can see, I got a while to go and I got a lot to talk about. So talking about credit and how to improve your credit. So we've been talking about how to read a credit report. Now, every week, every week, like every good instructor will do, I always bring some books for you. I always bring books for you because the book, the thing about books is this. If you read a book, it's like having a mentor. It's like having a God. It's like having somebody that can tell you how to do some things that you may not know how to do. So the easiest thing to do is read a book. So every show that I do, all 1,000 shows that I do, because I'm on number 13, I was saying I was going to bring in one book. But then... Every time I try to pick one book, I can't pick just one. I want to bring two or three. So I started bringing two or three books. So tonight I'm going to share some books with you that will definitely bless your life because I know they bless my life. So the first one that I'm going to bring to you, and like I always say, these are not books that I just got laying around the house that I'm going to just grab and bring in so that way you can say, oh, he had another book. No, 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 no. I don't even operate like that. People who know me, they, mm, they I'd be like, mm, go on with that. Go on with it. Um... This first book is a powerful book because the, the history behind this book is this. Napoleon Hill wrote a book, and I shared that book with you all on the show maybe a few weeks ago. It's called The Law of Success. The Law of Success. And The Law of Success was a 25-year study that this man did, Napoleon Hill, where he studied the richest and the most powerful people of his day. And of his day, that was in 19, between 1900 and 1920. So when we say the most powerful, we talk about Rockefeller. We talk about Carnegie. We talk about J.P. Morgan. We talk about Woolworth. We talk about Henry Ford. He was studying these people, right? So he came out with this, this volume of books, and it was called The Law of Success. So if you can imagine, it takes you about six, somewhere between four and six years to get your Ph.D. If you're super smart... And do it full time. You might be able to do it in three years. But on average, somewhere between four and seven years. So imagine if you studied something for 25 years. 25 years you studied this. Whatever this one subject was. So he studied it. And he came out with this book called The Law of Success. Now within The Law of Success, an excerpt from The Law of Success is a book that he created. It was called Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich is a lot more popular than The Law of Success. Because most people, when I talk to them, and I say Think and Grow Rich, they say, oh, yeah, 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 I know that, I know that. But better than th Think and Grow Rich is called The Law of Success. Now, Dennis Kimbrough, Dennis Kimbrough is a brother that's in Atlanta that's a professor of business at Clark Atlanta University. 
Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, PhD, and he teaches in the business school. So if anybody knows Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, tell him to call in here. I would love to hear from him, and uh, I got some words of wisdom for him. But he's one of my financial mentors because I think he's very enlightening. He talks about a lot of positive things that would help our people because this is all about us helping our people. So what he did was he got permission from the Napoleon Hill family to create a book. Now, y'all don't have to excuse me because I, I don't read this book. This is the back of the book. My producer. He, <laughs> this the, look, this is the back of the book. And uh, I've used this book quite a lot. And uh, let me tell you, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm just... <laughs> So the, book, <laughs> so the cover is gone, but it's a good book. I promise you. This is called Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice. Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice. And what he did was he took Think and Grow Rich from Napoleon Hill, which has keys to success that you can use that are universal laws that you can use to be successful. And what he did was took that book and created a book specifically about the excellence of black people. Now, one of the things that I always talk about on this show is this whole notion of people saying, oh, we can't come together as a group. We can't come together as a collective. And I was like, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Because God, if God can do anything, why can't we come together? So you marinate on that for a little while. I mean, you, you can call into the show if you got a comment about it. 678 381 1973, tonight is on fire. I see all the people from what? Duval. I love, hey, I appreciate the love. And, um, but this is a good book. So make sure you go out and pick it up. I've read it multiple times. And it talks about everything from self-reliance to uh, mindset to forgiveness. Let me say that word again, forgiveness. Because when we walk around talking about we can't stand a hater, the other part about being a hater is being unforgiving. You got to let that stuff go. Let it go. Because the people that you're mad about, they don't care because they ain't even thinking about you. You thinking about them. Let it go. Don't even, like, whatever. I don't even care. Go on with that. Just go on with that. So um, this book is a very powerful book. I would definitely encourage you to pick it up and um, it would definitely be a blessing to your life. It's called Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice. Now, we've been talking about credit. So one of the things I want to bring out, this book, this is a powerful book. This is probably the most powerful book no, I'm joking. It's one of the best books I've ever read. This, this is a book that I wrote back in 2007. It's called My College Finance, A Guide to Understanding Personal Finance for Students and Parents. The reason I wrote this book was I had one primary objective, to educate people about the importance of personal finance. That was it. I'm a registered nurse by trade. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a business. You know, I am a business person now because I just got my MBA back in August so Congratulations for everybody helping me with, with that endeavor. That was stressful. But um, when I wrote this book back in 2007, that was 10 years ago, I only wanted to educate people about the importance of personal finance. One of the things that I put into this book that I couldn't find in any other book that I thought was very important is this. If you want to purchase this book, you can reach out to me. Um, you can send me an email, dailybreadradioshow at yahoo.com. That's my email address. I have a website that's being built right now. The Daily Bread Radio Show is on its way. So thank God for that. So we're going to we're giving it, take it to another level. I got some more important information I'm going to share with you all tonight. It's very, very powerful as well. But within this book, what I did was I created a sample credit report because I felt like people didn't know how to read a credit report because most people don't. They don't go out and pull their own credit report, they don't see their credit until they go out to buy something and they only want to know if they've been approved or not. So I put a, a sample credit report in this book and within the sample credit report, this is the legend. And in the legend, it gives you all the descriptions of all the different credit codes, all of the history codes. And then on the next page, what I did was I made up some different scores and histories so that way again, when you pull your credit report and you get into that quiet place and you want to learn how to read a credit report, you can purchase my book. Reach out to me because uh, I took it off of Amazon.com and all of that because at the time they was charging me fees and I was like, you might as well pay me that money directly. I'll sell it to you half price. The uh, price, list price, $14.95. Excellent book. 
You can reach out to me. I, matter of fact, I'll sell it to you six, 60% off. That's better than anything that's in the marketplace. But this book is a great book to have as well. Not just saying it because it's me, because this, this was God. I, it was no way for me to come up with the information that's in this book. The stuff that I shared in here, this is God, and this is God at work. And what, I, what I'm going to challenge you to do is this. Share this information that I'm sharing with you all tonight with as many people as you can, because my primary goal is to do what? Help people. If you look on my Facebook page for the Daily Bread Radio Show, my motto is, I am here to serve. That's it. I am here to serve. I ain't worried about how long it's going to take. I'm not worried about what people are going to think. I'm 50. All my kids grown. I'm good. I, I, I'm good. I ain't, and I ain't trying to shine. I Because people who know me, that ain't my thing. I'm going to just go for it. But what I do want to do is this. I want to challenge our race to do better, be better, and be black excellence. There's no, there's no race of people on the planet Earth that's more intelligent, that has more resources, that have more perseverance, that has more toughness than the African American race. So if you think about all the stuff that we went through to get to this point in time, to where these, you know, these suits and these ties and drive these cars and house and all this crazy stuff, think about what we went through. Think about what our parents went through. Think about what our great grandparents went through. And we only about, let me think, let me think. My mother in law is 81. So we only about Maybe, maybe three, four at the most, four at the most removed from slavery. Four generations at the most removed from slavery. So what does that mean? That means we got some work to do. The Great Wall of China, it took them 1,700 years to build the Great Wall of China. We only been out of slavery, what, about a buck 25, buck 30, buck 40, somewhere up in there. It only been like this long. So we got a lot of stuff, but we persevered. We the bad. We are the baddest, most creative individuals and collective on the planet. So don't get me started about that. But the other book that I want to share with you all tonight was this is the most powerful one. Last week we were talking about Martin Luther King, and with Martin Luther King, when he started to talk, when he was talking nonviolence, everybody was cool with that. White people was cool with it. Black people. Some black people was cool with it because you had the Black Panthers and you had, you know, other groups that would say, nah, we ain't with that nonviolence. We're going to, hey, we're going to take it to them. If they come over here, we're taking it to them. And we still like that. So it was part of us that was like, I, I got to practice this nonviolence thing because I ain't with that slapping in the face and, and I don't do nothing. So <laughs> it, took, <laughs> it took a certain group <laughs> to get down with King, but he did have a group and he was very influential and he's one of the most iconic figures in African, not just African American history, but just from a human standpoint, because what he did was he was living like God. And whenever you start to live like God, you're going to be iconic because you're going to be doing some stuff that most people can't do, like letting somebody slap you in your face or bomb your house with your wife and your kids and then and bomb your house more than one time and have a type of wife that says, you know what? I'm gonna stay. Just think about that, ladies. It's a lot of ladies on Facebook Live. Just think about that. You and your husband, man, you love your husband. Think about if your house was being bombed because of something your husband was doing. Would you Would you be down? Would you really be down? Because you can, you can imagine what your mom is saying. Girl, get it from over there. They're going to kill y'all. But anyway, Martin Luther King was that type of guy. So when you look at your history, what I challenge you to do is go back and read your history. So last week we was talking about Martin Luther King. And this is just my personal opinion. Martin Luther King, nonviolence, everybody gets that. But the thing that a lot of people don't realize is this. Martin Luther King, one of his primary objectives in the nonviolence movement was economic, economic perseverance or economic improvement for the masses. Meaning he felt like all African Americans, because he called them Negroes in his speeches, all Negroes had the ability to come together as a collective and demand the things that they wanted. Now, think about this for a minute. If Martin Luther King walked in there and he was telling Bull Connor and all these other white people, this is what we want. We want equal rights. You know what they said? Man, come on with that. They told Martin Luther King, get out of here with that. Boy, get out of here. 
So get, what did he do? He said, you know what, I'm going to organize. I'm going to organize. And this is where y'all have to go back. And do your research. Look it up. You can Google it because everybody got access to smartphones, computers, whatever. He came back and he said, you know what? We gonna, we're going to develop the Montgomery bus boycott. The Montgomery bus boycott. And what did that do? The Montgomery bus boycott, what that did was it forced, it forced people that didn't want to listen to Martin Luther King, it forced them to listen to him. Why? Because he took that money out they got in their pocket. He took that money out their pocket and they called him every kind of name, but he made them respect black people because he said, we're not going to spend our money Riding these buses because we were on the bus. Wasn't a whole bunch of white people. We was on the bus going across town, doing all this domestic stuff, getting to our jobs, doing what we need to do. He took us off the bus. And we decided as a group not to ride the bus. Not know, oh, I'm going to ride. No, we were all together. We was all down together in Montgomery, Alabama. And for the people that don't have an appreciation for that, if you go to Montgomery, Alabama in 2017, you will know you're in a different place and Birmingham, Alabama. So I'm not even going to get into that. But the thing you want to think about is this. I'm going to share some information with you all tonight from some of his speeches that a lot of times people, they haven't publicized it. They don't want to talk about it. Because you know why they don't publicize it? Because they don't want us to know this is what he was talking about. So one of his most famous speeches was, I seen the promised land. This was his last speech that he gave that everybody says was prophetic and this was given at the Mason Temple the night before he was assassinated. And the thing that we always learn, even from kids, what did we learn? I've seen the promised land. I've seen what longevity has its place. Everybody knows that, right? But here's something that you didn't know that was in the I see the promised land. Check this out. It says, now the other thing we'll have to do, and this is an excerpt from the full speech. It says, now the other thing we'll have to do is this. Always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. Now, we are poor people individually. We are poor when you compare us with white society of America. We are poor. Never stop and forget that collectively, that means all of us together, collectively, we are richer than all the nations of the world with the exception of nine. This is 1968. Did you ever think about that? After you leave the United States, Soviet Russia, Great Britain, West, West Germany, France, and I can name the others, the Negro collectively is richer than most nations in the world. We have an annual income of more than $30 billion dollars a year, which is more than all the exports of the United States and more than the national budget of Canada. Did you know that? That's power right there if we knew how to pool it. This is Martin Luther King in 1968. $30 billion collectively. Now here's something for you to marinate on. Check this out. 1968, black buying power collectively. That's all of us. All of us, collectively, in 1968, Martin Luther King said that our black buying power was $30 billion with a B. Now, I'm going to challenge everybody on Facebook Live, on the radio. You can call into the show, 678-381-1973. 678-381-1973. Call in, leave a comment, shout out Duval, do something. Just call in, get on the air, You know, let us know that you're out there. But check this out, $30 billion in 1968. What was the black buying power in 1990? 1990. You know what the black buying power was in 1990? $320 billion. $30 billion to $320 billion in 1990. 1990 wasn't that long ago. That was a little while ago. $320 billion. Here's a better question. And if you know the answer, you can call into the show and let me know. Or you can put it on Facebook. $30 billion in 1968, 1990. So we done moved ahead, what, 22 years? 
22 years, we went from 30 billion to 320 billion. Okay? That ain't a long time. 22 years ain't a long time. Because most of the people that's on Facebook Live, I see you. You got kids 22. I got kids. I got three kids older than 22. So 22 is not a long time. 30 billion to 320 billion. Now you go from 1990 to 9, you go from 1990 to 2017. Do you have any idea as a collective how much what is the black buying power in the US in 2017? Let me help you out. 1 1.2 trillion. Now we done went from a B to a T. 1.2 $1.2 trillion. Trillion. $1.2 trillion. We ain't hurting. We not hurting. And can we come together? Yes, we can. Maybe we don't start off with the whole U.S. coming together. Maybe we start off right in your community, or right in your church, or right in your sorority, or right in your fraternity, or right in your neighborhood. But if you pool, if we get together and we pool our money together, what could we do? We could buy franchises. We could buy real estate. All of them got, I lived in Northwest Washington. I've seen it in Washington. I see it going on in New York. All the places where we used to live, they live now. I see it in Atlanta. All them cheap houses, all them, all them parts of town where people didn't want, I don't want to live over there. Go to Washington, D.C., the chocolate city, and see where they living at now. Go to Brooklyn. Go to Brooklyn. Go to Harlem, go to Chicago, go to L.A. and see, see where the white people living at now. I'm just, this is, and this is in the, oh, I didn't even give you all the time. I'm sorry. Look at this. A Testament of Hope. The Essential Writings and Speeches of Martin Luther King, Jr. That was just one excerpt. Now, that was from uh, The Promised Land. I've seen The Promised Land. Here's another one. Here's another one. This is from letter from the Birmingham City Jail. Everybody's heard of these. Everybody's heard of these letters. Here's an excerpt from that one that talks about personal finance and economics. We decided to set our direct action program around the Easter season. Now you know how much money we spent on Easter. I ain't even go. I'm not even gonna tell you how many goddamn soups I done got from Robert Hall laying them out. If I ain't go to church no other time of year, my mom always had me laid out for Easter. And they said, no, we gonna, this is what he told us, we ain't going to spend no money for Easter. We're not spending no money with people that don't support us for Easter. He said, we decided to set our direct action program around the Easter season, realizing that with the exception of Christmas, this was the largest shopping period of the year. Knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action. We felt that this was the best time to bring pressure on the merchants for the needed changes. Then it occurred to us that the March election was ahead of us, so we speedily decided to postpone action until action to after election day. This is 1968, y'all. Come on, this is 2017. Tell me we couldn't do the same thing. I see stuff going through on Facebook. Send this to somebody. If you had the guts to pass this on, I'm like, I got guts, but I'm not going to be doing no change out on Facebook. Think about this. If you send out a message about all the stuff that we don't like, all the stuff we can't do, all the people you know, everything we need to get down with, if we send out something and say, hey, August 1st, August 1st, we ain't spending no money with such and such and such. We don't. We forgot all about Texaco and how they did us. We, A lot of people, and y'all old enough to remember that, that whole racial scandal with Texaco, we be over there pumping that gas, not like, ain't nothing never happened. And it's a lot of businesses that take advantage of black people that don't treat us the way we need to be treated, and we still spend our money with them. And we don't have no voice. We don't even care. $1.2 trillion. So check that out. The last one I'm going to leave you all with tonight is uh, a testament of hope. Because we got about 10 good minutes before we end the show this evening. This is the last one, testament of hope. All this is for Martin Luther King. This is what Martin Luther King was talking about. He says, in fact, American Negroes have greater collective buying power than Canada, greater than all four of the Scandinavian countries combined. 
American Negroes have greater economic potential than most of the nations, perhaps even more than all of the nations of Africa. We don't, and he got need italicized. That means with emphasis. We don't need to look for help from some power outside the boundaries of our country, except in the sense of sympathy and identification. That's deep, man. So we got some work to do. So with me, what I'm doing, I'm doing something. But I'm just going to say, hey, I'm going to just do my part. Um, I received a letter this week, and one of the things that I created back in 2012 was a nonprofit organization because one of the things that I see that's starting to become prevalent in our, excuse me, in our communities is a lot of our kids are going to college, which is a great thing, but when they get to the last semester or the last year of college, a lot of times they've exhausted all of their funds because college is more expensive now than it's ever been. Uh, we see it on the news. You hear about how much debt students are coming out with. And a lot of students get to the last semester even. They get to the last semester and they're not able to get cleared for graduation. And it's a serious, serious, serious topic. So I created a I created a nonprofit organization with the hopes of people would have the opportunity to do two things. I only I set this nonprofit up for two reasons. The first reason was to educate people about the basics of personal finance. Because here's the thing you want to keep in mind. You can only teach your children and your children's children what you know. So if you don't know what Doshiqua means, if you don't know what Dobre Uthro means, because that's another language, is no way that you can teach it to your children. So if you don't understand personal finance, if you can't read a credit report, if you don't understand the difference between principal and interest, if you don't understand how we're being taken advantage of and things of that nature, what we're going to do is turn around because those babies that we have, the babies turn into adults. And when our babies turn into adults, if we don't have that information to pass on to them, if we don't have that information to put them with a tax attorney, put them with an insurance agent, put them with someone who's a tax strategist, they're going to keep doing what we've been doing the generation before them and the generation before that. But like our family, like our parents said, they wanted it to be better for us. And it is better for us. They sacrificed a lot for us to be better for us. The jobs that we have now, the places we live, the cars we drive. You think back to the 70s. You think back to the 60s. Because I'm a 60s baby. And a lot of you that's on Facebook Live, y'all are 60 babies. Think about in the 70s. We weren't living no out in Bay Meadows and out at the beach. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. I ain't know no goddamn black people live at the beach. Went to Fletcher. Who went to Fletcher? Like, I ain't even... I was in high school before I even realized it was a high school called Fletcher. Like, Fletcher? No, bro, we was on the north side. And we went about 15 miles from the beach. Now people from all over the world, all over the U.S. come to Jacksonville to go to the beach. And we grew up there and didn't even... I didn't even know it was a beach there. Other than Ferndina. Because we went there on where? Easter. And we ain't even had no trunks. We got in, this, we got in the Atlantic Ocean with our drawers on. That's how far we came. What no swimming trunks. You take your pants on, you get in the water with your drawers on. That's how we got down in Fernandina Beach. But I created this nonprofit organization because what I wanted to do was provide a platform where people could be educated about personal finance, learn about the basics, because we're not going to get into advanced. Learn the basics, you know, punt, pass, and kick. That's all we need. Just get the basics. Don't get into nothing advanced like, you know, contracts and derivatives and all this other stuff that's going on. Get the basics and be able to get the basics for your family so that way if something happens, somebody in your family is a responsible party to say, no, we're going to do it this way. Now, what you want to do is, with this nonprofit, and that was the first thing, I wanted to provide a platform where people could be educated about financial literacy. So I, I titled, the name of the, the nonprofit is the American Financial Literacy Association. Sounds, it got a nice catchy tone, put the American thing in there so that way we can come in under the radar, maybe get some funding. The other thing that I want to do with this one is I want to raise money for scholarships specifically for students that's in their graduating year, either their fall or their spring semester, 
and they've exhausted their funds and they need a little bit of help to graduate. That's it. The third thing that I've learned about financial literacy and I've learned about having a nonprofit is this. When you donate funds to a charity, you write it off dollar for dollar on your taxes. Now, I don't know about you all, but the IRS, the, the tax code in the IRS said you can donate up to 50% of your adjusted gross income to a charity. And then you turn back around at the end of the year and you write it off. Now, the stuff that I've read and seen, our president, our president, use these type of strategies to ensure that when he gets his tax bill at the end of the year, he's 30% of his income is not going into taxes. So you can go back and look at the origin of the Boston Tea Party and what that was about. When the Americans was fighting against England, it was about tax. So if you're going through life and you're just paying these taxes like haphazardly because they just out there, you need to get educated. You can give 30%, you can give 10%, you can give 5%. But I have a platform if you want to contribute or if you want to create a tax strategy. And just know that your money is going to be going to help students to graduate from college. It's a great thing. Um, I'll have it out there. I'm partnering with them and partnering with some other groups to just, you know, just try to make my space a little better in the world. So uh, the thing that I would say is, Make sure that you continue to share this information with all your Facebook friends and all the people at work so that way we can counterbalance some of that negativity that's going on in the world, like the haters and people who are being so you know mean-spirited to each other because we got some kids that we got to get educated. We got some, some financial literacy that we have to improve. We have some things that we can do as a collective. $1.2 trillion. It could be your church. It could be your Girl Scout troop. It could be your girl club. It could be any of that. But we need to come together and pool our resources. So that way, if you want to start a franchise, and the franchise is $10,000, why not get 10 people with $1,000, and then you got a subway. You can put your subway down wherever you put it at. And I, the 10 of you all, y'all share the profits, or y'all share the business, and then you open up another one. And then you open up another one. That's black economics. That's what we got to get back to. Black economics and sharing with each other and not being so just me, me, my type of stuff. Just let's share with each other so that way we can all progress together. Um, I definitely want to thank you all for this evening. Powerful show. Powerful outpouring of love on Facebook Live. I see my son. I see my daughter. I see um, people from my high school. People, All the people from Duval. Duval. I see my my I see my sister in law I see my brother in law I see just that's just love so like I've always said as you are chasing dreams it's nothing like seeing people that say hey man keep going keep going so that's why I'm just keep going don't worry about me if you tune in next week we're gonna be here from eight to nine eight p.m. to nine p.m. right here Facebook Live and we're gonna be talking about credit, money, things that, that we can do to empower ourselves, play the game a little bit better. If there's anything that you think that I can help you do, you can reach out to me via email, dailybreadradioshow at yahoo.com. Dailybreadradioshow at yahoo.com. Dailybreadradioshow.com is coming. It's in the works. We got about 30 more days. The website will be up and all the content will be on. We I talked about starting a debt club on the 4th of July because I wanted to coincide with Independence Day, but I think that I need to do a little bit more work on that because I'm not going to just throw something out there and just have it just any willy-nilly. So I'm going to take a little bit more time. I'm going to pull that back. Hopefully I'll have it out uh, to coincide with the launch of the website so that way we can, again, have something that's a nice product. You'll be you know, proud to share with people. It won't look like, you know, oh, he's just doing this or that or whatever because I can't do it by myself. I just need you all to just, just push it out there. I'm pushing it out on Facebook and YouTube and all other Social media, I talk about it at work, I talk about it wherever I'm at, just telling people like, hey, we need to learn more. So that way, your kids and your kids' kids, your grandkids will understand how this game goes. And we can start to move ahead because 200 years from now, I'm going to leave you with one last thought. The average 
net worth of African Americans in the U.S. is forty nine hundred dollars. That's the average net worth. Anything that I say on the show, just Google it. Just go out and look. Forty nine hundred dollars. That's the average net worth. The average net worth of um, the average white family is one hundred and eleven thousand dollars. It's estimated that it would take us two hundred years at the pace that we're going to catch up to night family's net worth. But one thing that they didn't count on was that dude up there, our father. Our father can do it all. Our father can do it if we believe. And I believe our father's going to do it because if he wasn't, he wouldn't even have me here talking about this. I'll be somewhere doing something else. So I believe our father can do it, and I believe you believe it. So we got to start speaking into existence. So I love you all. I appreciate the love. You know, hit me up on Facebook. You can hit me up on um, email. You can even hit me on Twitter. Joaquin Thompson Senior at Daily Bread Radio. I'm still, that's the ongoing joke. I'm still practicing on Twitter because the response, when I start responding, I don't know who I'm, <laughs> I don't know who I'm responding to. <laughs> but, see, but I will respond. I don't know who I'm responding to, but I do respond. And uh, it ain't nothing but love, y'all. Y'all have a beautiful evening. Check out this jingle. This was done by my cousin. And from where? Duval. He created the jingle right out of Reball High School. And, uh, yeah, right out of Reball High School. A lot, I love this dude. So check the jingle out. Check me out next week and uh, keep showing love and keep sharing this with everybody. All right, thank y'all. Y'all have a good evening. I ain't playing the jingle. Y'all ain't playing the jingle. Oh, you don't want to play that? That's what I play the jingle. Then play that. No, man. I just told the people you're going to play the jingle. That's why I showed them that right there. That's why I showed them right there. Oh, nah, man. Okay, we can, we can skip past play this part. Jingle. Okay, then, we'll skip then we can play that. No, you don't know that. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. What? Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> man, you got to let the people in. Oh. <laughs>